Uh, this guy right here is a quartzite layer, and it's partially uplifted. The, the, these layers stayed horizontal, but they went for a ride. You know, when the train stopped, the horizontal layers uh, went for a ride, but some of it uplifted. And that caused that quartzite, that's a quartzite rock embedded in those horizontal layers. Looking again, how did that block of quartzite, how did, how did this block of quartzite that was in that previous layer, how did it come from this layer and then be displaced to the, to the side of it? Easy to explain with the hydroplate theory, very difficult for others. Okay, and this is, uh, this is George Hess's animation, and let it roll. And that's why, that's why we're living in a very seismic area. When we crashed up and over the Pacific Ridge, there's, there's imbalances that are still there. There's trapped water underneath our mountains. There's trapped magma underneath our mountains. And we're in an extremely seismic area. Why is it, and you know, people wonder, why is it that they call this area the ring of fire? And I've been watching earthquakes on a daily basis. This is from the USGS earthquake site. Uh, I've been watching and plotting actually on a database the number of global earthquakes just to keep an eye on it. And the size of these squares are the magnitude of the quakes, the color of the squares is how soon they've been, whether one within the last hour, within the last day, or within the last week. But always you see this number of earthquakes or greater that are concentrated here. Why? Because everything, according to Walt Brown's theory, everything came crashing there. And that's where there's still instabilities of this earth. This earth is still trying to get round. It's trying to get rid of all the unbalances associated with these crustal changes that occurred a few thousand years ago. As soon as everything crashes up, it's sitting on top of the mantle, and it wants to sink in the mantle. But the mantle is, it is putty. It's not water. So it can't sink immediately. And so over the years, it's been sinking down, and we know, it, people wonder, how did animals get from this island? How did the Galapagos Island finches get stranded there? Where did, you know, how did animals get from one continent to another? Because they were all connected. This is immediately after the flood. This is probably what the Earth looked like. And because they're shallow areas, and everything you can tell is connected, it would have been easy for, for people and animals to get from one place to the other. Over the years, the mantle, the mountains sank down into the mantle, causing this effect to occur as you watch. And again, this is based on actual areas of the Earth that are relatively shallow. We can't appreciate it because we just see ocean. You don't see the shallow areas. And so now we're in this condition where, you know, we're separated by a large amount of ocean waters. And so that also uh, would have occurred had this been the way we got to where we are today. As the waters ran off, any place that would have been this huge basin with earthen dams would have created a huge lake. You know, as the waters ran off, if there was a dam, it would create a huge lake. Dr. Brown spent an, a year in the area of the Grand Canyon. He found evidence going through the deserts of Utah, Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico. He saw evidence of water all at the same elevation everywhere along there. And, he, and then theorized, at one time there used to be a lake, and he named it Grand Lake, and now this is very you know, popularized by other Christian organizations, but they never say that Walt Brown did the research. It, and it's for reasons I uh, am baffled by. Uh, but then if this dam broke right here, what would you have created? Uh, you would have created that. And not by that little old Colorado River running for millions and millions of years through all these layers. You would have had one mother of a flood as the dam broke and the billions of gallons of water washed from the Grand Lake through this gorge of freshly laid down sedimentary rock uh, creating the Grand Canyon. There's a law of physics that, that any spinning sphere wants to spin where the greatest mass is at the equator. So when this crustal change was happening on the Earth, all of a sudden it was spinning before the flood, it was spinning in an orientation that had the greatest mass at the center of the Earth, or at the, at the equator. <clears throat> Because the crust went on a big ride, 
than the upheaving mountain ranges, every mountain range that popped up is now wanting to get to the equator. So the mountain ranges in the south, southern hemisphere, they're wanting to move the Earth up north. The mountain ranges in the northern hemisphere, they want to move the Earth south. And they're competing for each other, but the most massive mountain range on the Earth is the Himalaya mountain range. And so it was the predominant force wanting to roll the Earth from the north, where the Himalaya mountain range was much closer up to the North Pole when this crushing effect happened. That mountain range wants to move down south, wants to roll the Earth. So that means that if I, and here's, Here's now, because of the equator of this shotgun shot, that white dot is where this ball wants to be, the North Pole. So I can spin this ball in any orientation, and this ball will want to make that white dot the North Pole. Now it still spins with the axis in the exact same place, but the ball is actually rolling on the ice, and it's going to ultimately roll to the point where that white dot is again the North Pole. Either that or, <laughs> you know, physics is changing. And that's, it's just a simple fact. Now, the, what can throw this off is, again, the unbalance effect, which it's wobbling because we didn't perfectly counterbalance what he was doing. But the Earth wants to do this too, by the way. It wants to wobble because of our imbalances. <clears throat> it ultimately gets down to the point where all those forces work together and we will see that that thing goes to the North Pole. And while it's doing that, uh, I wanted to also say, as the Earth has bulged because of the centrifugal force, people on the equator are traveling 1,000 miles an hour. And there's a centrifugal force associated with that because it's 24,000 miles circumference, goes once in 24 hours, so it's, so it's 1,000 miles an hour. So if the Earth is going to roll as a result of what we've been talking about and the crustal changes, if it's going to roll, then, then the bulge is like this, it, it's rolling. Well, the bulge doesn't want to be where it was. The bulge wants to be at the, at the new equator. But, but the Earth doesn't want that bulge to go to someplace else because something's going to have to rip to make it happen. Does everybody see that? The, the bulge is going to have to do something to the Earth to grow to that new place. And Dr. Brown theorizes that that 90 East Ridge is where, when, when the Earth rolled, that 90 East Ridge is the scar on this planet of where that bulge grew from where it was to where it is today. Because it, it, it had to rip the earth to get to where it is today. Now, I knew this before the Sumatra quake. Saturday night when the Sumatra quake happened at the end of 19, uh, or 2004, it was a Saturday night I remember because the last thing I did after getting ready for the Sunday service is I checked my earthquake map and I go, whoa, <laughs> there was a major earthquake. Which, which in the, all the years I'd been watching earthquakes had never happened at the very northern tip of the 90 East Ridge. And I even wrote a letter to Walt Brown saying, Walt, well, look, the, the north end of the 90 East Ridge just had a massive earthquake. Why, why did that earthquake happen? Because the 